Hey everybody, Evan Savage here. I'm the pastor of Grassroots Church. Thank you for joining us uh, by watching our messages from this past week or maybe weeks before. We are glad that you're taking time out of your week to learn, to engage with our church from an online point of view. We would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings for tangible community worship and of course some messages as well. Uh, and if that interests you, you, we would love for you to join us at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Thank you again, and I hope that this message is edifying to your spirit. We are continuing our series on 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, this week will be in chapter 7. Uh, and we're talking about marriage. And... Uh, it's one of those things, you know, going through uh, a whole book of the Bible, uh, it forces you to wrestle a lot. You wrestle a lot with the text. You wrestle a lot with what Paul is trying to convey, the message he's trying to convey. But it also gives you some perspective of kind of the, 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 the narrative that Paul is, is bringing us into, which culminates in this great chapter, uh, in chapter 15 which is kind of the point of the whole letter, but we'll get there in like 18 months from now probably. So, But when we talk about marriage, there's so much that we could talk about. And if you've been to churches before, we've done like marriage series, series, series with the thing at the end. Um, we, there, there's so much that you could talk about with marriage. How to have a strong marriage, how to keep the spark alive. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do any of that nonsense today. Well, and that's not nonsense because those are good pieces of advice. But we're not going to do that today. Uh, we'll save that for another time. But today what I really want to do is uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we are going to talk about uh, ultimately what marriage is and by default what marriage is not. So what marriage is and what marriage is not. And there's going to be some sections on divorce and stuff there. But I think Paul frames that actually very, very well, and we'll get to that when we get there. But before we get into it, let's pray together. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and uh, allowing us to gather and to worship and to wrestle and to expand our ideas and expand our hearts. Lord, I, I pray that you allow us to become more aware of your spirit this morning, your spirit in our lives, your spirit in this place, and your spirit in this community. And what we do not know, Lord, teach us. What we do not have, give us. And what we are not, please gently make us. And in your name we pray. Amen. So we find ourselves here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and there's a little bit of a tonal shift that takes place here. Uh, Paul begins by kind of telling everyone to stop being dumb, and then he addresses a, a one or two very specific uh, uh, quote unquote sins that are infiltrating the community. And now we get to like Paul, it's like QA time with the Apostle Paul. So from s chapter 7 all the way to the end, Paul is going to answer some questions that the Corinthian church had written to him. And he's going to answer them partly in his own voice and partly quoting scripture. And you'll see there. But from now on, like we get to uh, kind of similar questions that, that maybe some of us would have, uh, like in chapter 8, Paul is, a, uh, chapter 8 through like one word of chapter 11, Paul is talking about uh, personal liberty. I, I was reading that, I don't know why they put this like one word in chapter 11, but whoever did, did it. Anyhow, the, and so he talks about personal liberty, and then he talks about church order, like how do you gather, what is the order of a gathering uh, who can speak within the Corinthian church? And we'll get, we'll get to all that confusing stuff when we get there. He talks about spiritual gifts. He talks about speaking and teaching. He talks about, like, the one question that I think a, a lot of people would have is, which gift is the best gift, right? And he addresses that. And then he, at the very end, he addresses some doctrinal issues in chapter 15. And I will tell you this, we are going to spend, what is it, six weeks in chapter 15? I think we're spending six weeks in chapter 15 alone. So we're going to squeeze every ounce of Paul's uh, teaching on the resurrection when we get there, which will culminate in Easter. Isn't that cool? It's kind of like we started this series right uh, in the uh, right God 
did it for a reason, I suppose. Who knows? But right? So when we get here in this chapter 7, and Paul's going to talk about two different topics. He's going to talk about marriage and singleness. Uh, and one of the things I want to begin, for those of you who are married or who have been married, I think we all know that marriage is not easy, right? I think um, a lot of times if you watch like, I don't know, Home Improvement or something, marriage looks easy, right? It looks fun. It looks exciting. It looks like it's this wonderful thing. But marriage, all said and done, is not easy. And I don't think marriage is meant to be easy, right? We always have these questions, and Paul's going to address some of these, like who can get married, what to do if you get divorced, what are the boundaries that take place in marriage, and next week we'll talk a little bit about singleness. So one of the, a little caveat for today, uh, one of the things that Paul, that, that we could tell that this is a letter, is that Paul, didn't, he didn't write it like a book. Like he didn't come up with a thesis and then write an outline and then write this thing down. He wrote a letter and so by the time he gets to one point, he tends to circle back every once in a while to previous points he made. And so we had to split this, this message up into uh, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 7 and 10 through 16. Next week we'll address the other half uh, when it talks about singleness. And one of the beautiful things I love about chapter 7 is, if you recall last week, do you remember what the last phrase Paul says to the Corinthians in chapter 6? He says, he says, glorify God with your body, right? We talked a, bit, a little bit about that last week. And so this really what you could do is you could put glorify God with your body at the beginning of this section. We all know that Paul did not write in chapter and verse. That was originally done by the Archbishop uh, of Canterbury. His name was Stephen Langdon. Did that way back in the 1200s. So 1200 years after Paul was when we get the chapter and verse thing. So he wrote glorify God with your body. Then he gets into this message and this teaching on it really continues the teaching on sexual immorality that took place last week. And, he, and some of this is a prescription, a prescription of how to avoid sexual immorality. And some of this is just uh, Paul just spitting his own wisdom in, in, in many regards. But it's a, it's a great example. So this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, then 10 through 16. Uh, relationships, I think, and we've talked about this significantly, relationships, whether it's platonic relationships or spousal relationships, relationships are, the, are at the center of human existence. Relationships are at the center of human existence. This is why Jesus reduces, in, in a way, reduces the law and the prophets down to two relational commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you actually look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are split up into commands of loving God and commands of loving. One, don't steal your brother's stuff, you know, don't commit adultery, and honor the Lord your God, you know, don't use his name in vain, stuff like that. And so I think at the center of human existence, we, we find relationships. And there's like, I, I, I saw somebody say, human existence is really an X, Y axis. We have relationship with God and relationship with one another. And everything could be reduced into those two relational categories. And at the center of any sort of relationship or the idea of relationship, at the center of that expression is marriage. See, marriage is the oldest and in many ways the foundational, the foundational institution throughout all of history. It's the oldest institution in history and it's the foundational institution of all of history. I think some of the most Asked questions that people have or people ask me have to do with marriage and relationships. People want to know answers, like I know the answers to those questions, right? But I think if we look at society as a whole, at the, at the very basic found, uh, foundation of society is, a strong, is strong and healthy marriages. This is why the government gives you tax breaks, by the way, if you are married. Because the government, on, by and large, knows 
that if marriages are secure and strong, then the rest of society will eventually fall into place. Um, now, whether that works or not, <laughs> who knows, right? It's the government. Who cares? And I think the questions surrounding marriage are all generally good questions. But one of the things I don't think we ever do is we never actually address what marriage is. Right? We, we kind of do like, oh, biblical marriage is a union between one man, one woman for all eternity. Go and uh, be happy. Right? I think we say things like that. But we never actually address what marriage is actually is and what it actually represents in the world. But let me begin a little disclaimer before I get into the rest of this. In no way am I a marriage expert. Yes, I've been married for 11 years, right? 10 years? 11 years? I don't know. Something like that. It's more confusing than you guys not think. Anyhow, there's a story behind that. Um, uh, So we've been, but in no way am I a marriage expert. And let, let me say that In no way is anybody else in this room a marriage expert either, right? Everybody who gets married or everyone who is married is, is, is living in a constant, lifelong discovery of the secrets, the purposes, and the skills of what makes a marriage successful or long lasting and love filled. There's nobody in this room or nobody in whatever other room, there are people who can help you with your marriage, but nobody is actually like a real on, full on marriage expert except for God. And apparently Paul, no, I'm just kidding. Paul, anyhow, that was a, can we laugh a little bit this morning? Come on, good Lord. Anyhow, so let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter seven, beginning in verse one. Now, in response to matters that you wrote about, Paul says, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Pause. This is a a quote that Paul is using uh, from the letter that was sent to him. Uh, Part of the question was, is it true that we should not have sexual uh, relations with a woman, or if you're a woman, with a man? And Paul kind of turns around and says, it is good, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. A woman. Paul, if you didn't know, is single. Now, one of the things that is confusing for a lot of people, and I think whenever we talk about what is good and what is bad, we tend to think that one thing is good, which means the other thing is bad, right? Paul is saying singleness is good. He is not saying, therefore, marriage is bad. Marriage is also good. Singleness is good. We'll talk more about that next week, but it's not the only good. Uh, too often, I think, in our Western world, the, the evangelical church world, as well as Western, especially American culture, we, we tend to rush into things like marriage a lot. Uh, we, we, we te- society, I think, one, society is an achievement society, achievement-driven society. I need to achieve something in order to have self-worth or whatever. And then we tend to look at marriage as some form of achievement, right? Oh, if I get married, now I'm an adult. Well, it's way easier being a single adult than it is being a married adult, right? So we see marriage as some form of achievement. And then if marriages uh, uh, get, get broken or we don't get married at some point, we don't find that romantic partner, then we look, we see ourselves as a failure or society looks at, oh, that guy's been single his whole life. Why has that guy been single? I know a guy who's, who is a great, he was like a judge in the South, and he's, he was purposefully single his whole life, and people look at him, and when I tell people that, they're like, that guy's weird. I'm like, no, it's just like, singleness is good, and he, he really, really uh, enjoyed being single, I suppose. But we see marriage too much as an achievement, which, which, brings us out of kind of the beauty of singleness, the, the opportunity that, the spiritual opportunity that singleness uh, affords, us, affords us. Again, we'll talk about that next week. I don't want to get too much in the weeds there. And we know that from Genesis chapter 2, that marriage is a, a deep and important goodness. Genesis chapter 2, God says, it is not good for man to be, to be alone. I must make a partner for him. And he makes the wife. And so we do know that marriage is also good. So 
what does Paul say? Now in response to the matters you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but it is not the only good. Verse 2. But, because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. Uh, this is, Paul is prescribing the issue that we talked about last week of sexual immorality. It's a very practical prescription that Paul is giving here. One, Paul is obviously uh, forbidding polygamy, right? So Paul is prohibiting polygamy. The, the thing here is it wasn't too far before Paul that uh, people had multiple spouses. It was not that far, not that far before Paul. And Paul is really what he's doing is he's bringing marriage back under God's headship here. He's bringing marriage back into like the intended covenantal relationship that, is, that it is designed to be. He's also saying that sex is for marriage and sex is essential for a healthy and strong marriage. Verse uh, 3, a husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Uh, a lot of people dog Paul because they think he uh, doesn't believe in mutuality in marriage. This verse throws that out the window, right? This little passage. There's mutuality in marriage is essential. Um, in other words, it's, it's that you know, mutual submission that takes place between a husband and a wife. That if we see our bodies as that, that which belongs to my spouse, then I can only do one thing, that's honor my spouse with my body and my actions. It's mutual submission and sacrifice of our individualistic desires. Verse 5 do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. See, it's good to take a rest. There's so, much, so many moments in Scripture where we are encouraged to take a rest, obviously a Sabbath. We're encouraged to take a day off and not do anything. And, and as we know, Sabbath means to recenter our lives around God. It's also good in, in our relational uh, capacities as well to devote ourselves to be to devote our marriages and our lives around God. I think uh, you know one of the things that we tend to forget about temptation and all of that is that Satan has a lot. I think Satan has a lot of influence, specifically over our sexual lives. Uh, the temptation that takes place. You see, in Corinth, as today, sexual activity was, uh, in you know, more modern terms, you would say, doing what comes naturally. You've probably heard somebody say that uh, around, that, that sex is just this natural thing, just do whatever comes naturally. And that was true for Corinth as well. But I think it is clear that Satan deliberately concentrates, he deliberately concentrates much of his subtlety in sexual temptation. He concentrates much of his subtlety in sexual temptation. You see, since we, we are to honor God with our bodies as well as our minds, as well, of our, as, uh, as well as our souls, as well as our uh, strength, that the easiest thing, I think, for Satan to get into is to, is to uh, mess with our attractions, our, our sexuality as a whole. I think in our day, sexual, sexuality and sexual temptation is the greatest of all temptations in our day. The, the open access to things like pornography. And I'm not just talking about like internet or the back room at, at the video store. Like I'm not talking about just like that. It's the over-sexualizing of, over-sexualization of things virtually in all industries. All industries. Music, television, movies even in our educational system, even in, you, you go, I, I, I was, when I was in the army, we had to like go to like sexual classes. I was like, this is weird. We're, why, why? You know, like, why, why do I have to do this? The sexual over-sexualization is throughout all industries in our society, and they can become tempting. You see, the world, the worldly sexual ethic is, uh, you're going to do it anyway, Right? That's the worldly 
sexual ethic. You're going to do it anyway, which, if you ask me, is not very much of an ethic at all. But back to this. Paul says, don't deprive one another, because sexual, the Satan will come in and start to tempt you. Don't deprive. Don't, don't you know, keep yourself from your spouse for uh, reasons, right? Uh, verse 6. I say this as a concession, not a command. So this is Paul. This is not a command. This is Paul's concession. I wish, Paul says, that all people were as I am, single. But each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, and another has that. Right? And so Paul is saying, yes, I, I wish, you know, I love being single. I wish, I, was, I wish everybody was single. I wish we could all just devote all of our our relational power to have relationships with relationship with God and to proclaim the gospel. I wish we didn't have to worry about our, us. Nobody had to worry about spouses or families or stuff like that. But he says, but I, I know that people have their own gifts. I think Paul finds immense joy in his singleness. And in many ways, Paul is acknowledging the, the strong temptation that sex and sexuality could have on a being. So he's saying, hey, get married. Go get married. Let's continue. We're going to jump down to verse 10. To the married, Paul says, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Paul is quoting, quoting, quoting scripture here. Now Paul is going to do some commentary. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. For the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Wife, for all you know, you might save your husband. Husband, for all you know, you might save your wife. That Paul is saying something distinct here about the Christian idea of marriage, specifically in relationships to if your spouse is an unbeliever. That the believer is responsible for carrying the burden of the covenant. Does that make sense? The believer is responsible for carrying the burden, and it is a burden. Covenants are not, not burdens, right? Covenants are hard. And the believer is responsible for carrying the covenant of marriage. You see, divorce is always, almost always, almost always, I will say that, let me clarify. Divorce is almost always tragic. Like, but like everything, there are ex exceptions to the rule. Primarily in the Christian world view of divorce, it's abuse and infidelity. Abuse is, uh, like, unfortunately a relatively new thing for, for Christians to accept as a grounds for divorce. But even Jesus says infidelity, you know, for the exception of infidelity, you are not to be divorced. But every rule has an exception. If you're like me, I'm going to find the exception and try to live in that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but every rule has an exception, and for the Christian ethic, it's primarily infidelity and abuse. But I think the desire for marriage is that it, we remain, that, that it, it remains holy. It, our, our relationships and our, our marriages remain unified, that, that our marriages remain kind of a separation from the rest of the world, that it's a holy, unified, uh, uh, God-blessed thing that we live in that we don't invite anybody else into those relationships. We don't invite anybody else in, and we don't purposefully uh, neglect our spouses. Now, I get it, and I'm fully aware of the cultural moment uh, that some of you in this room have walked the path of divorce, I think, uh, more than what you probably would know. And, and, and I think Paul recognizes that as well. Paul does not say, if you're divorced, you can't be in the church, if you're divorced, you know, that's not what Paul's saying. Chapter, uh, verse 11 says, but if she does leave, in other words, he's acknowledging the truth that divorce will indeed take place. But I think we all know on some level that divorce, especially when children are involved, and they're just tragic, and they're, 
they're just, it's just tragic. But I think that's kind of the beauty of the church is, is to surround one another, to pick up those pieces, to help put lives back together, to walk in grace and truth and mercy and compassion and in love. You see, one of the funny things I was, I was reading about kind of the history of marriage, specifically in the West, uh, it wasn't until fairly recently that marriage was seen in more contractual terms, right? You sign a piece of paper and now you're married, right? That, that it wasn't that, that marriage kind of went from being a union of two individuals to being like a benefit or an avenue towards benefits. Historically, I think, I love what Paul is doing here when he's talking about the spouses and the, the, that the salvation will come through the believing spouses because historically, salvation, if you go all the way back, read the book of Ruth, salvation, salvation comes to a family, not an individual, historically in, in ancient Judaism. Salvation comes to a family. That's how, that's how the Jewish people, that's why like, they, they, the weddings were, were not so much about like, do you, do you love one another? Do you love one another? Get married. It was, let's continue the salvation of the family. If you read Ezra and Nehemiah, that's why kind of that, all that uh, interbreeding stuff that's in Ezra and Nehemiah is in there because would we know that salvation would come to those families? It was more of a historical kind of a concern thing, but it wasn't until very recently where marriage became hyper-individualistic that it's two individuals living under the same roof while two, rather than two individuals becoming one flesh. So really quickly, what time is it? Uh, who cares? Really quickly, I want to talk about what marriage is and by default what it is not. As some clarification thing, biblical marriage, what it is and what it is not. So the first thing is this, marriage it's a sacrifice, not a fulfillment. Marriage is a sacrifice, not a fulfillment. Do you ever see, uh, what is it, Jerry Maguire? You complete me. You know, uh, it's, 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 you don't find somebody who can fill a hole in your life. That's not what marriage is. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a unification. It's a covenant. If you are looking to be fulfilled by your spouse, then your cup is almost always going to be half empty. Marriage is a covenant, not a fulfillment. Um, I, w- I was thinking, you know, Heather and I, we have a marriage counselor, and our marriage counselor said, we need to find fulfillment in Jesus, and then, like, like the spouse is just like the icing on the cake. But if we find our fulfillment in Christ, then the spouse is simply the icing on the cake. And I want to say this really, really clearly. Uh, marriage is not for everyone. It really isn't. It's, it, it is not for everyone. And I think there are people who should not get married. Uh, when I, I don't do so many weddings anymore, but for a couple of years I did a bunch of weddings. And I, and I told people, I said, I'll marry you, but I, you have to go through some sort of premarital counseling. I got to actually see if you, guys, if, if, if you guys should be married. Or is it just like an achievement thing? The next step in life, the way to become an adult. There are people who should not get married. And the truth of the matter is, because marriage is a sacrifice, if you cannot, if you cannot, or if you are unwilling to sacrifice everything for your spouse, then you should not get married. If you're not willing to sacrifice your career, if you're not willing to sacrifice your dreams, if you're not willing to sacrifice your ambitions, then you should not get married. Because marriage is self-sacrificing yourselves every single day for the rest of your life. And if you cannot do that, then you need to think long and hard of what you should. So it's a sacrifice, not a fulfillment. Unless the Steelers game is on, then it's all Heather's sacrifice at that point. Anyhow, the second thing is this. It's a journey, not a destination. It's a journey, not a destination. We tend to think of marriage as like the culmination of love. We love each other so much that eventually we spend $30,000 on a wedding and go broke and be miserable for the next few years, right? Marriage is not, what did I say? Marriage is a journey, not a destination. The truth of the matter is, is love does not result in marriage. Marriage results in a more perfect love. Uh, our, our pastor from when we lived in Georgia, our pastor 
was very clear about this. He said, and, and I've looked it up. Do you know, like, the first documented marriage in the West, the first documented marriage based on, off of love was, do you know when that was? The 18th century. That was not that long ago. It used to be that when you got married, that your lives were, you were committed and you were sacrificing for another, and then your love would grow over time. And that hopefully by the end of your marriage, you, you loved your spouse far more. And it's still true for us who get married for love today. You love your spouse far more than you love them on the day you got married. The problem is when we think of marriage as like the pinnacle, and we think that's like the, 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 the climax of romance right there, then there's only one way to go, and that's down. And so we have to see marriage is not a destination. It is a journey. It's a journey to learn how to love your spouse more every day. The third thing, marriage is a commitment. It's not a contract or benefit. Our society sees marriage as really a benefit-gaining contract. You know, they, 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 they put all the stuff in there, tax breaks, health care, all that, and that stuff is good. We, you know, we should be able to have that, but marriage, that's not what marriage is about. It's a commitment. It's not a contract. Marriage is, is, regardless of what the benefits are, regardless of what the benefits are or lack thereof, I am going to be committed to this institution. That's what it is. And the fourth thing is this. It's a covenant, not a right. I think marriage, uh, as we've stated in the past, it's, it's not a picture of romance. I think we tend to think that. It's a picture of God's love and desire and commitment to humanity. It's not a picture of romance. There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. But it's a picture of God's love and self-sacrifice that God became flesh and dwelled among us so that we all might live. It's a picture of sacrifice. It's a picture of God's love. Read the book of Hosea. That is, yes, it's about Hosea and his prostitute wife. But that's really not what that's about. It's about God and man. God's love and commitment to to mankind. And so it's a covenant. It's not necessarily a right. I think their their marriage laws and marriage things like that are all relatively new to society. And so it's not necessarily right, but it is indeed a covenant. I think, I've, I've read this this past week, I think when we think of marriage of all the reasons stated for like divorce and, and whatnot, um, I think there's a more deeper spiritual problem that we have to address. And I think a lot of times uh, when we fall in love, we fall in love with a personality and then we get married and then we have to learn to live with their character. And we're not really taught about that, right? We, we fall in love with a personality or in my case, a lack thereof. Uh, we fall in love with a personality not, but then we have to learn how to deal with and live with the character. You see, we, we treat marriage too much as a decision rather than a calling, right? We treat marriage too much as a, well, people say I should get married, so I should get married. Let's, you want to get married? Let's get married. And then we go, after we get decide to get married, we go to our pastor or spiritual advisor or whatever, and, and the pastor has to kind of backtrack and say, we got to do some premarital counseling because you have to know their character because you fell in love with a personality. And now we have to dig deep, and you have to get to know their character before you get married. And I think that's really what premarital counseling is all about. It's about exposing character issues that you would not expose to one another. Right? It's forcing you to talk through those things. And we tend, again, we tend to see marriage as the pinnacle of life, but it's not. Because when we see it as the pinnacle of life, and we see it as this choice, we see it as two individuals, not as a union, the second something goes wrong, and the seeds of doubt begin to creep in, we grow apathetic, or maybe resentful, or maybe we fall into temptations that present themselves. And then once temptations present themselves, those temptations turn into opportunities. And opportunities tend to destroy. I mean, I think seeing marriage as 
this lifelong covenant, this true self-sacrificing institution, far more than love. Yes, you should love your spouses. You know, Paul is very clear on loving your spouses. But it's not more like rain, it's not like rainbows and castles and butterflies. It's sacrifice. It's loving your spouse as Christ loved us. It's putting yourself on the cross daily and your spouse putting themselves on the cross. And Paul writes here. He really, it's kind of a funny little section because he's like, if you can't control yourself, you might as well get married, but it's better to be single. It's kind of what Paul is saying. But because marriage wasn't necessarily about love for Paul, marriage was about the sacrifice and the, the sacrifice for another. And the beauty of being in a church family like this, where we can laugh and have community and engage with one another, is that we are, quite frankly, a family. That when their marriages are going tough, or we're not sure of whether or not we should get married, or maybe we're divorced or single and we're struggling with that, that the church's job is to come around you and to, and to fill those kind of relational holes that are not there. Not the spiritual hole, relational. To come alongside, to love, and to cherish, and to offer you a community of grace, mercy, hope, redemption, salvation, and truth. So how should we see marriage? We should see marriage as a sacrifice, not a fulfillment. A journey, not a destination. A commitment, not a contract. A covenant, not a right. And for those of you who I know whose significant others are non-believers, don't worry about it. Salvation has come on to your house. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.